webinar um, on growing Kai under an increasing dry. Um, my name is Nick Credit Henry. I'm with Manaki Fenua Land Care Research and the Resilience to Nature's Challenges National Science Challenge. Um, for those of you that may just be joining, uh, this is the second in a series of three webinars. Uh, the first was last week looking at the physical science around climate change and drought. Um, this one is on drought and, and farm profits and community resilience. And then next week is a webinar on land use change as a response to changes in drought. Um, all of this is leading up to an all-day symposium on the 31st of May at Tapapa in Wellington, um, which is being organized by the Deep South Resilience and our Land and Water National Science Challenges. So thank you, first of all, for coming along. Um, today's topic, as I say, is farm profits and community resilience. The format is that following a bit of a brief introduction from myself, uh, we'll hear from two speakers, uh, leaving with us leaving us with about 20 minutes for questions and answers. Um, and if you could please address your questions using the Q&A panel, um, you should find it at the bottom of your screen. Um, we will we'll ask the questions for you at the um, following um, the second presentation. Um, it's difficult to monitor everything in the chat, so um, you can still use the chat for comments, um, but if you could just direct questions to that uh, Q&A box, and if you could also please just indicate uh, which of the speakers um, you'd like to hear from. Otherwise, I'll simply assume that it's uh, open to uh, either Bill or Kenny to speak um, in, uh, in response to your question. Um, a video of today's webinar will also be made available. That will be circulated um, by the end of the week. And um, information about the National Science Challenges um, and sign up um, to get email newsletters will also be provided. So to begin with, it's probably worth just setting out a bit of a, a context in terms of what we sort of think about when we talk about resilience and why it sort of matters in terms of policy and practice. So of course, rural New Zealand is quite a highly, quite a dynamic multi-hazard environment. Um, and this has significant implications for rural communities and of course, agriculture. These hazard events aren't new, um, but they are arguably becoming more complex. At the national level, agriculture accounts for about 7% of our GDP and about 6% of total employment. Um, Agro-food products are about 60% of New Zealand's exports. So it is a significant sort of economic driver. Then at the farm level, uh, farms are increasingly capitalized. Um, land values have gone up. Farms are leveraged. They're also built and reliant on networked infrastructure on they're increasingly connected through financial, social, and other networks across multiple domains, making them vulnerable to compounding or cascading hazard events. So as we saw 2016-17 um, in North Canterbury, the region had been through a prolonged drought and then the earthquake in 2016 on top of that and the stress that that caused for rural communities. Uh, these adverse events can be felt as economic shocks in terms of profitability, or effects on employment, which can be quantified, um, but they also have sort of less visible and more uh, subjective, as it were, effects, which can be much more difficult to untangle. Impacts, so those might be psychosocial impacts, impacts on well being, um, or other aspects of rural livelihoods. So, resilient agriculture, though, is fundamental securing, to securing New Zealand's well being economically and otherwise. And as we heard last week, climate change is here and it's now. Uh, Luke Harrington presenting last week talked about the 2012-2013 drought and he showed that evidence from a number of models suggested that the meteorological drivers of that event were more favorable for drought as a result of anthropogenic climate change. More recently um, in a paper from um, Jim Salinger and colleagues, they look at the 2017-2018 uh, dry conditions, and they suggest that that heat wave over that period provides a pretty good analog for the sorts of things that we might anticipate closer to the end of the 21st century. And then looking ahead, we heard from Andrew Tate, who su suggested again, or confirmed um, what has long uh, sh been shown, that that trend towards hotter and drier conditions, particularly in Eastern regions, is likely to continue. So climate change is here, it's now, but what does that mean and what can we do about it? 
So land-based primary industries, agriculture, horticulture, forestry, and rural communities can be thought of or described in terms of complex social ecological systems. They include both economic, social, and cultural functions, as well as being connected to and dependent on soils, land, water, and climate. And for the most part, these have adapted to long-term mean conditions. But as a result, they're exposed and sensitive to any changes in variability and or changes in extremes. So those relatively stable long-term conditions have provided the basis for productive primary sector. However, those changes also mean um, when the climate changes, they are much more vulnerable. As a result, um, recent research has now actually quantified the costs of drought, um, work by Dave Frame and colleagues, and has shown that it's now overtaken flooding as New Zealand's costliest natural hazard. So drought can have significant impacts on the land and on people who drive a living from it. Between 2017, between 2007 and 2017, it's estimated that drought-driven climate change cost New Zealand taxpayers about 720 million in insured damages and economic losses, about six times the figure for um, flood damage. Drought is also a complex hazard and its impacts are not evenly distributed um, across the landscape or across human populations as we'll hear from Bill. Impact and severity can vary according to different properties and characteristics of communities or of the environment. Um, in short, some primary industries and rural communities are more sensitive, some are more resilient, some are better able to cope, some are better able to respond than others and manage adverse events. So how are communities affected by drought? What makes some of them more or less vulnerable or able to cope? So resilience has become a popular concept within research policy and practice over the last few years. It's come from a range of disciplines, from engineering, ecology, and other fields. Um, but it's often described as the ability to bounce back from disturbance. It implies some sort of a return to normal um, following a disturbance. A household, a community, or an ecosystem can return to the previous condition. Other views of resilience emphasize nonlinear change, unpredictability, complexity. They look at the interrelationships and the dynamics across different systems um, and the effects of disasters and the way those unfold socially, culturally, economically, and otherwise. In other words, resilience can be about learning, self-organization, and the capacity to buffer against shocks. And there's actually, for a small research community, there is a lot of work underway in New Zealand on resilience. This work comes from sort of complex systems and social ecological systems, which uh, myself and colleagues have done. Um, Alan Kwok um, from Massey University has looked at social resilience and the characteristics of communities and places. Uh, Penny Payne and um, Bill um, have also done work on rural resilience and the resilience of rural communities. Um, Joanne Stevenson and Vivian Ivory have looked at how do you develop indicators and metrics for resilience? Um, and Ryan Pollock has taken a sort of a geospatial approach to looking at resilience in rural regions and quantifying and looking at risk exposure. And so resilience thinking is now making its way not only from research, but also into policy and practice. Um, so in order to address outcomes for Aotearoa New Zealand, um, there's been growing interest in recent years. We now have a national disaster resilience strategy the National Climate Change Risk Assessment and the national, forthcoming National Adaptation Plan um, and uh, MPI's uh, adverse events um, policy on responding to uh, disasters in a rural context, all implicitly or explicitly acknowledge the interaction complexities and feedback between the natural environment, the built environment and human activity and ways in which these are connected. So while resilience is often described, however, there's significant challenges to operationalizing the concept for policy and practice. There's questions of normativity. Um, so who's resilience? Resilience of what type and for whom? People may be locked into resilient but undesirable states of poverty or marginality, or systems may have ongoing negative environmental impacts, but they might be incredibly stable. There's the question of scale. Um, In-depth case studies can provide insight at a local level, but policy at a national level often needs other sort of lessons. So how can we transfer insights um, at scale? And finally, as we'll hear from shortly, there's the quantification gap. So often the key factors associated with resilience are intangible. Um, they might be difficult to, object or to measure objectively. Um, however, public bureaucracies 
are often reliant on, in, on objective measurement targets and indicators um, to operationalize policies. So what gets measured gets managed. So how do we measure resilience? And what do we do about those subjective measures? Trust, sense of community, how do we deal with those? So overcoming these challenges to sort of adapt resilience as it were for policy and practice is not straightforward. However, there has been work across the science system to consider and advance resilience-based approaches to dealing with adverse events. So in the following two presentations, we'll learn about different approaches aimed at overcoming some of these challenges and understanding the effects of drought on rural communities. So in the first, Kenny Bell and colleagues look at how better to understand and quantify the financial impacts and implications of drought on productive systems, focusing on profitability and overall employment. And in the second, Bill K. Blake will present work that he and his colleagues have done on rural on, on developing metrics for rural resilience and looking at rural communities. Aggregate indices and measures of resilience can help identify vulnerable or at-risk populations and ensure appropriate and early targeting of interventions and understand some of those underlying causes of vulnerability. So in such a short time, it's going to be difficult to cover the sheer scope and scale of resilience-related research. Um, but it is an increasingly big tent. And hopefully um, there will be an opportunity to discuss more of these aspects in the Q&A following um, our presentations, as well as at the symposium on the 31st of May. So without further ado, I shall now pass over to Kenny Bell. Uh, kia ora koutou. Thank you, Nick. I'll just share my screen. All right, uh, yeah, kia ora everybody. So I'm gonna be uh, talking about uh, this project that tries to quantify the impact of climate change on pastoral farm profits. So I acknowledge my co-authors here, um, also acknowledge a um, co-authors on this report, also acknowledge my colleague Simone uh, Pirali, who's working with me to turn some of these results into a paper as well. So internationally, there's been a lot of work that's been done trying to quantify the impact of weather on economic and social outcomes, and also a lot of work that tries to translate those outcomes into uh, forecasts or projections of what we might expect uh, to happen to those um, outcomes under climate change. So these are diverse as agricultural yields, human health, labor supply, um, GDP, cognitive performance, um, energy use, even antisocial behavior. Uh, however, as Nick mentioned, there's this uh, quantification gap in Aotearoa. So we've got um, some really good work that thinks through these problems um, in complex ways. Uh, but what is sort of missing uh, is, is a large body of work that tries to quantify impacts on economic and social outcomes and try and translate those impacts into um, projections of what might happen under climate change. And so what this quantification would enable is answering questions like, is a particular adaptation action worth the cost? Uh, so said in another way, what are the dollar um, and other benefits of adaptation, which can then be weighed against the costs of, um, of various actions? So to plug uh, a small part of that gap, our research is gonna ask a couple of questions. So firstly, what's the historical relationship between local weather and then and dairy and sheep beef farm profits? And then asking conditional on those relationships holding in the future, what does that suggest would happen to those farm profits in the, in the future? And we use this data-driven approach to answer that question. So we're taking uh, this really nice weather data set that NIWA provides, measuring um, or uh, uh, estimating daily uh, soil moisture and temperature across the country based on weather observations, uh, and then leveraging New Zealand's uh, high um, world leading, I'd say, data infrastructure um, this longitudinal business database that Stats New Zealand hosts and uh, using several data sets within that database to try and measure farm profit per hectare. So that's using trying to measure uh, 
land use and land area using agricultural production survey and then using tax return, uh, a tax return data set to try and measure farm profit. And uh, then NEWA also provides uh, downscaled climate projections, which we use to translate those, those historical relationships into um, what we might expect under climate change. So that's based on <clears throat> six global simulation models that uh, provide input data to um, these local climate simulations that downscale those, those coarser global models to, for the New Zealand context. And that downscaling is done using um, knowledge of the local, local weather patterns. Uh, and we're going to use two scenarios from this, these climate projections. One, uh, a high climate change scenario, RCP 8.5, and a moderate climate change scenario, uh, RCP 4.5. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about how this statistical model works. So we're going to be combining weather data with uh, profit data to try and um, detect patterns, um, that trying to detect the causal effect of changes in weather on farm profits. So to do that, uh, what we do is, is a few things to control for um, confounding factors. So firstly, we're going to control for average farm performance. So what that's going to do is it's going to say, well, if if you happen to be a really talented farmer working in an area that tends to be dry, the effect of that is going to be taken out of the model. Uh, so it's what that's going to do is it's going to take out average farm performance across time for each farm. Then we're going to control for uh, regional effects for each year. So what this is going to do is it's going to control for price effects at that regional scale, um, as well as of course at that national scale. So if there are local market um, impacts that uh, are, are correlated with drought, those are going to be controlled for. And so we're isolating that impact of the local scale um, on, on farm profits. And then what it's going to do is it's going to try and uh, estimate the nonlinear impact of remaining variation in soil moisture and temperature on profit per hectare looking back three years in the past. So what it's going to do is it's going to allow that model to say, if there was a drought this year, I'm going to measure the effect on profits this year, as well as profits next year and the year after. Um, and we, so we look at uh, whether there are those flow on effects onto the following years. So straight to the results. Um, just try and explain these graphs. So the x-axis on each of these graphs is uh, soil moisture. And so what that's meaning is that you've got um, dry conditions in the left part of the distribution and wet conditions in the right part of the dis distribution. So drought um, is measured by going left in these graphs. And then the y-axis is the change in profits that the model estimates as a result of taking one day at 20 millimeters of soil moisture deficit, which is quite a wet condition, and swapping that out with a day um, at a different level of soil moisture deficit. So um, if we look at the far left part of the uh, graph for dairy, which is this left one, say, um, what this is saying is if we swapped out a day at 20 millimetres of soil moisture deficit for a day at 140 millimetres of soil moisture deficit, so going from very wet, relatively wet, to very dry, um, what that would do is um, cause a reduction in annual profit of around one day's worth of um, profits. So that's for dairy in this period 2016 to 2018. That's approximately $4.40. And that's about the number that we end up um, losing by changing that wet day into that dry day in the model. Moving to sheep and beef. Um, and sorry, I'll, I'll explain one more thing. So this red line here represents loss in profits in uh, the current year. So we, are, we don't find any, um, any clear effect of uh, a drought on subsequent years in the dairy industry. It's really just concentrated in that same year. But moving to sheep and beef, we've got a few more lines here. So the red line is uh, the impact of um, the impact on profits in the current year. This lighter blue line 
is the impact on profits in this the year after a drought. And then this dark blue line is the combined effect. Um, and we don't find clear effects um, on that for that third year for sheep and beef. Um, so we actually find very similar results for sheep and beef as we do for dairy when we look at that combined effect. So um, when we look at that combined effect and we look in proportion to operating profit. So taking that day at 20 millimeters of soil moisture deficit for sheep and beef and swapping that out for that day um, at minus at 140 millimeters of soil moisture deficit, that dry condition would cause about a dollar 30 worth of um, loss in annual profits over those two years. Um, so part about 40 cents, I think, from that first year, and then about a dollar or 30 cents in that first year, and then about a dollar in that second year. Um, and as a proportion, so as a proportion of daily operating profit, that's it's almost exactly the same as the result for, for dairy. Dairy just ha has higher operating profit per hectare uh, than a, a sh typical sheep and beef farm. We don't find clear effects of uh, temperature on dairy farm profits. So I'm not gonna show you those results, but we find uh, at least suggestive effects of um, an impact of temperature on sheep and beef profits uh, on sheep and beef profits. So the graph on the left is, is pretty much what I just showed you. Um, this is the result for soil moisture when temperature is also included in the model. Um, and the results are pretty much the same as when we just include soil moisture. Uh, looking at temperature, um, we uh, so the, the units are a bit different. So we're looking at hourly temperature now. Um, so I won't explain too much um, what the magnitudes are, but we see suggestive effect of uh, increasing effect of temperature on profits from around 10 degrees to 20 degrees Celsius, uh, which is consistent with a lot of agronomic um, growing degree day style models. And then after 20 degrees, we see the suggestion of a loss in profits that is steeper than the gain that you would get in that, um, in that uh, more moderate temperature part of the distribution. Um, and yeah, so I won't talk too much about the magnitudes except to say that these are quite large effects. And um, as we'll see when we see the climate change results, they can have material impacts on, um, on the implications for climate change. Uh, okay, so projected effects of changes in soil moisture under climate change. So this is displaying uh, mainly results for that high climate change scenario. That's the red, red lines. Uh, and then there's this um, plot at the end, which uh, shows the, the distribution for the final period 2100. And that's compared with the um, effect for that moderate climate change scenario in the, in the final period. So what this is saying is that um, changing soil moisture will cause uh, moderate reductions in taxable profit for dairy farms um, and reductions starting from day one. So we've got reductions going out to 2040, then a bit of a pause and then further reductions from about 2060 under this high climate change scenario, resulting in um, a projection in that final year of about a 20% loss in taxable profit compared to the numbers for 2016 to 2018. Um, and it all, when comparing that final number with the number for the moderate climate change scenario, it shows um, clear, if, uh, clear benefits of global climate action that would uh, reduce that loss in profits for the dairy sector. Uh, similar pattern for sheep and beef, except the numbers are a bit smaller as a proportion of taxable profit. So we end up with um, about 7% loss for sheep and beef, just changing soil moisture. Looking at uh, impacts on um, sheep and beef profits also accounting for that temperature change, uh, uh, we find quite a, a lot larger effects, but effects that are also much more uncertain. So this is the y-axis here is much larger um, than the previous plot. Uh, and for comparison, I've plotted the effect just changing soil moisture from the previous graph. So that's this, this long dashed red line um, is this line from the previous graph. So you can see that accounting for that change in temperature in the middle estimate 
results in and severe losses for um, so severe losses in profit for sheep and beef farms of around 54% by the end of the century. And also much larger gains from um, climate action, which would change, would potentially um, switch us into this moderate climate change scenario. Just also want everyone to note that the error bars here are very large. So the 95% error bars I've estimated here range from about 0% loss to about 100% loss. Um, just quickly, I'll talk a little bit about implications. So as I said at the start, these, these results could be used to value the benefits of adaptation. For example, if a dam was being proposed for irrigation infrastructure, that's going to come at some cost. And then it's going to uh, flatten out that response curve to changing variable soil moisture for farms. Um, and the benefits of flattening out that, that curve could um, be measured directly using these results. Results could also be used to price weather indexed insurance. Um, so ins an insurance product which hypothetically paid out based on expected losses um, that are measured based on the results of this model. Um, these, uh, these could be used for that. And as a, um, as a side note, there's also drought support from central government, which this could be used to, to sort of size the, um, the amount of support as well as direct the, the locations of support, which is another type of, in, um, of insurance, I guess. So final conclusions, the results support the conclusion that avoiding the worst climate change would pay dividends to Aotearoa farmers. Um, and if we uh, believe those results that show that um, temperature might have large impacts on sheep and beef, that would imply that there would be severe losses avoided um, by avoiding the worst climate change. Also mention um, this, this came up in the previous webinar, um, that RCP 8.5 is probably not a reasonable um, business as usual scenario anymore, based on both uh, climate action that is already ongoing and um, expected, as well as trends in the energy system. However, there's enough uncertainty in things like economic growth, um, as well as the climate modeling itself, which says that um, RCP 8.5 climate change is still possible with, um, with enough likelihood that it's worth including in these sorts of comparisons. Um, and a final point, if we're going to forecast the impact of climate change on farm profits, we also need to know what will happen to prices. And that's not something that's included in this project. It's just holding prices constant at those historical levels. Um, but there's a lot of complexity in forecasting prices and um, price changes due to climate change. It combines effects on agricultural productivity globally, as well as expected changes in subsidization of agriculture, um, as well as technological change, which might be induced by climate change. It's quite, um, quite complex um, and uh, something for, for uh, clever future research to try and address. All right, I'll leave it there and hand over to Bill. All right, thanks, Kenny. All right, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, e mahiana ho ki te New Zealand Institute of Economic Research, NZIER, ko Bill K. Blake toko ingoa. Thanks everybody for coming today. I will um, go through my work, which is about uh, rural community resilience, um, and I will link it into some drought research that we did. So uh, just to start off, the key ideas that I want to um, cover off today. Um, the first one is back to this definition of resilience, just to um, highlight that when we are talking about resilience in this work, we have both the idea of bouncing back and bouncing forward. So the bouncing back is some kind of identity that people are trying to return to. And the bouncing forward is about adapting to change. So coping with change and finding a new equilibrium. And we talk about both of those in our work. Um, 
what I'm going to show you is some work that we talk, we undertook because we wanted to understand whether we could measure community resilience. And it turns out that we can. Um, it's not perfect, but it, um, it does tell us something and it does provide some useful information. Um, and once, once we start measuring um, indicators of resilience, we can then use that information to classify communities. So we can group communities together and um, get to this idea that um, Nick brought up that when government's trying to create policy or plans, it needs to have a view of the whole country. So some of our work has, invo has involved uh, case studies, in-depth case studies where we hold workshops in communities and we get to know people and their issues. But um, that's uh, resource intensive work. So um, when we're trying to do nation national policy, it helps to have national level indicators or work that we can do at the national level, which I'll show you. Um, and then finally, I'll link this into drought because it actually helps us understand drought impacts and also um, how to intervene um, when drought happens. Um, just a bit of acknowledgments and some of the basis for this work. Um, usually this would go at the end, but I want to make sure that, that I, I covered it. Um, the guts of this is from a, a program at Ag Research called Resilient Rural Communities, uh, and that's our website. Um, probably the, um, well, out of that program, we wrote a book that condensed a lot of material uh, for a popular audience. That book is called Heartland Strong, uh, and I've, I'm told it's readable, so, so that's good. Um, we also, um, NZIR did some uh, drought research for MPI last year, and so some of that work um, informs this. Um, NZIR is a nonprofit organization and we do public good research. And uh, last year we funded a whole stream of work on COVID-19, which supports this. And so the funding then has come from Ag Research, MPI, the Ourland and Water National Science Challenge, and NZIR's public good budget. This is the core of the, of the resilience work we've been doing. This is our resilience framework. So it's a, it's a kind of a, it's a pie diagram or a radar diagram. And we identified six components to resilience. So the outer ring is your external challenges to resilience. So these are all the things that a community has no control over, that it has to respond to. That kind of sets the boundaries for the community. The other five form um, slices of the pie inside this diagram. And so these, these will be familiar to you. We've got social, cultural, environmental, and economic resilience. And as well, we have a fifth one called institutional resilience or organizational resilience. In our work, we discovered that um, it's not enough to talk about those first four, but you also have to talk about the institutions that exist to support them that provide some continuity. Um, so we, when we talk about this work, we use all of these, these six dimensions. We use this pie diagram to talk about whether a community has more or less resilience along each of the five um, uh, internal dimensions. And in this diagram, which is just an example, um, we've got a community that is low on environmental resilience, very high on institutional resilience, and then has middling levels of the other three. So it forms a bit of a profile of the community. To get the data to inform this framework, we had two different sources. Uh, one source was that official external data. Um, and I, I've since learned since we started this that anthropology has some terms for this. So the external one is called your ethics source. Um, what we did is we went and looked at the resilience literature. We came up with a long list of the indicators that, um, that prior researchers have said are important. And then we whittled that down to about 12 to 15 indicators, depending on the work we're doing. And then we used data from, New Zealand, from Statistics New Zealand to estimate the resilience for different communities. And most of that data comes from the census. The other source of data was this uh, uh, detailed case study workshop um, uh, research that we did. And that's your um, EMIC. Uh, style of research using the anthropological terms. And with that, we went into communities, we held workshops, we discussed with them what we were doing and worked through each of the different dimensions and found out from them how they felt their community did. 
Importantly, and this is published in our, in our uh, journal articles, these two views don't line up. Now for the rest of the talk, I'm going to be using the official statistics because I'm trying to get that national level view. But I do want to have always alongside that, this little asterisk that says the view from inside the communities isn't the same as the view from outside. So that's our general framework. Here are two graphs. I know they're a bit busy, uh, but I'll explain them to you. These are two graphs from, uh, that are outputs from using this framework. And the key idea here is that if you take this multidimensional framework and you collapse it into a single resilience index, where you can just line up communities and say, this one's more resilient than the next one, that actually gives you a little bit of useful information. So it's worth doing. On the left-hand side, this is um, work um, that comes out of our COVID impact work. What we did is we put all 300 some rural um, uh, SA2, so statistical analytics to um, uh, areas. So uh, it's a census uh, category. We took all 300 rural ones and we lined them up from top to bottom on this resilience index. And that is your, um, your left-hand um, axis uh, or your, your um, vertical axis. The horizontal axis came from some COVID modeling that we did. So we took some projections from the treasury and we estimated the impact on different regions um, from potential COVID impacts. And we looked at the regions that the communities were in and we mapped out in, 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 on this um, two-dimensional graph, their resilience versus projected losses of employment in their regions. And we came up with this, what I thought was a nice diagram. And when you look at it, you see you've got a few um, communities up in the top left-hand corner, Wakatipu Basin, uh, Upper Clutha Valley, et cetera. So these are uh, areas that have high resilience, largely because of high economic resilience. And we projected that they would have large employment losses due to COVID. And that's what happened. What that tells us then is that they have a lot of base resilience, but they're also going to have large losses. Um, so that's a group to keep an eye on. In the bottom right-hand corner, we have another group. Um, they start off with low base resilience, uh, but we actually didn't project large employment losses. Now that's actually kind of reassuring because when you've got vulnerable communities, they, um, a large loss can be uh, devastating. So these communities like Cape Runaway, East Cape, et cetera, um, although they have starting off from low base levels of resilience, we weren't expecting large COVID impacts. In fact, the biggest um, lesson to draw from this diagram is the, is the empty space. The empty space in the bottom left-hand corner would be communities with low resilience and high employment impacts. And we didn't find any communities that were like that. So that was quite hopeful because it said to us, well, the COVID impacts aren't going to fall on uh, vulnerable communities. So I'll move over to the right-hand graph. This again starts off with that same list of communities from most resilient to, to most vulnerable and has that same resilience index on the uh, vertical axis. The horizontal axis is the um, variable out of the last census called administrative enumeration. Um, you might remember there are some issues with the, um, with, um, the um, last census. They didn't get enough uh, responses to some of the questions. And so they, in order to fill out the data set, they went to other data sets in a process they called administrative enumeration. So what happened was I laid out the resilience index against how much data had, data had to be filled in, how big the gaps were, and came up with that um, cloud of spots. And then I ran um, a regression line through that spots. And you can see that there's, a, that there's a slope there and it's a pretty good fit. Now, why this is important is because it tells us something about policy. So if Statistics New Zealand had asked the question, before they went out with the census. And they said, hmm, we only have a certain amount of resources to, to spend on people going out into communities and collecting data. Where should we target those resources? The resilience index actually would have given us a good indication. We could have said, 
Right, well, the places where you're likely to have problems are those vulnerable communities, and this is where they are. And so you start from the bottom and work your way up, and even if they'd only been able to put people in, let's say, 10% of rural communities, we could have told them the best 10%. So that's an example of how this information could be used. So let me move into drought then. So we did a project for MPI on the 2019-2020 drought. We collected information where we could about the drought impacts and we did some interviews. And we found some interesting stuff about looking at the drought impacts by industry and looking at the drought impacts by location. In a very gross generalization of the findings, um, kind of a rule of thumb generalization, we found that in the dairy sector, there was more cash, and so there was more ability to buy in feed. Where in the sheep and beef sector, there was a more reliance on social capital, on relying on networks to find out where the feed was and kind of get a hold of it. Uh, by location, we found that different places had different sources of resilience or different resilience resources. And we then provided some advice that says that gives you different ways to reach out to those communities and support them. So what I want to do now is walk through those different types of communities. So the first type of community is that socially connected community, the one that has really high social resilience. That diagram there is an example that's from Central Hawks Bay, and you see that the social dimension is very large compared to everything else. On these diagrams I'm going to show you, we don't have environmental resilience captured, and that's because the databases don't exist uh, to do that. So where we're doing social and environment, uh, social and economic and cultural resilience at the community level, we don't have databases that allow us to do environmental resilience at the community level. Uh, the other four um, internal dimensions are all kind of a middling level. So what this says is there are some places that have high social resilience, they have good access to vehicles, good access to telecommunications and internet, and the advice then is that drought relief can focus on using formal organizations and formal um, communications processes, as well as informal networks to connect with struggling farmers. And there are lots of places that follow this profile. So I've put a list there of some of them, Central Hawks Bay, Far North, Gore, et cetera. So that tells you what resources those places have and how you might reach uh, drought stricken farmers. Um, the next one that we looked at was economically resourced communities. Now, in this case, I haven't given you a diagram because none of the communities that we found affected by drought fell into this category. So, for example, you might think of those um, communities that I had in the upper left hand um, uh, quadrant of that graph I showed you, um, where you've got like Wakatipu Basin, um, those are economically resourced. In this case, they weren't heavily hit by drought. Had we found those, um, you might have um, responded to the drought by working through market channels. So in that case, you're trying to make sure the market's working well, but the social networks and reaching out might not be as, as necessary. If you're not thinking about drought, Selwyn and South Wairarapa are examples of these kinds of communities. Um, there were other communities we found that were mixed. We called them mixed because they didn't have any one big source of resilience. They kind of had a bunch of different ones. Um, so South Waikato and Waitomo were examples of those communities. Um, in that case, we would advise that drought relief needs to reach out through multiple channels. You can't rely on one. So a bit of, of reaching out through markets, a bit of reaching out through social channels, a bit of formal, a bit of informal, and then through a combination of efforts, you will hopefully find all of the farmers, all the drought stricken farmers. And then the final group was the Maori centered communities. So the example in the work in the drought work was Wairoa. So these are districts that have high cultural resilience and high scores on Maori fo focused uh, indicators. Uh, and in those cases, you might uh, want to work through Maori organizations and relationships. So, and there are a couple of other districts there, Kawarau and um, Apodiki are two other communities that have a similar profile. So again, that gives you a way, uh, a recommendation for how you might reach out to farmers in those areas. Um, so just to wrap it up, I think, uh, I hope what I've shown you is that we can actually 
provide some measure of community resilience. We can operationalize this idea, and we can do that both from inside the community and from outside. It gives us a way to classify communities, and we can do that either multidimensionally in that kind of pie diagram, or we can do that as a one-dimensional index. Either way, we learn something. And then this, this research provides a few implications. So first of all, we know which communities need resources and need more support. So I gave, gave you the example of the uh, census administrative enumeration where it, we can see ahead of time where the problems could be. It gives us a starting point if we're thinking about a strength-based approach to dealing with communities. It gives us a way to identify the strengths of communities that we can work through to respond to a drought. And then the final implication is if we want to include the environmental resilience in this, we need more research so that we can get that, uh, that view at the community level. So that's what I've got. Kia ora. Thank you very much, uh, Kenny and Bill. So we've had a few questions in the um, Q&A and please feel free to continue to add to those. Um, so I'll just begin um, with Kenny. A couple of people have commented um, and inquired about the extent to which the model implicitly assumes that farms don't actually change, that they're static. And so whether or not, and, and if so, how, um, that's been taken into consideration. And then, you know, if, if farmers do adapt or do change their systems, um, how that might affect results. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, thank you for, for that one, those who asked it. Um, and I didn't mention anything about it in the talk. So what the model assumes is that adaptation will be similar to the adaptation that's been done in the historical period. So farmers have already adapted to the current climate um, and there's sort of heterogeneity in what that climate is in the, in the historical period already. Um, what it doesn't do is account for adaptation that, that would occur sort of leaving the, um, the, historical, um, the historical range of conditions that, that already exist. Um, and so that's a, it's a limitation. There's been a little bit of work um, overseas that tried to address that. And they found, um, uh, this was a US-based study, they found about a, um, I think it was a five to 10% change in the final results. So it was, and that, that's really reflecting that adaptation, while it is beneficial, it's still costly. So, um, and so accounting for that cost of adaptation, you um, don't see these massive benefits of, of adaptation to climate change. Hmm. Yeah. Thanks for that. And just also another um, question for you, Kenny. Um, I, I'm not sure if you were at Luke Harrington's presentation last week where he talked about sort of the significance of this sort of accumulation of heat um, and the significance of this kind of individual extreme event years. Um, and so it's just, and so Luke, Luke's just kind of asked whether or not you've kind of disaggregated the effects of sort of drought, high temperature years, um, or whether, yeah, to what extent does it kind of the model actually take account of those really discrete um, extreme event years? Oh, you're, and you're just on mute, Kenny, sorry. Thank you, thank you, Nick, uh, appreciate that. Um, thanks for the question, Luke. Uh, the model um, takes keeps track of the full daily distribution of both soil moisture and temperature. Uh, I've got resilience challenge, can you mute? <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, so it keeps track of that full daily distribution, including those extremes. Uh, we didn't find clear effects of temperature um, on the dairy industry, as I said, but we do see those effects um, coming through of those high temperatures at the upper end of that um, temperature distribution for sheep and beef. Uh, the model is pretty limited by historical observations of really high temperatures. Um, if there's just been one day at 35 degrees in, in a place, it's not really going to uh, reliably estimate the effect of, um, of that one day because it's mixed in with um, well, yeah, all these other years and it's it's just sort of uh, an n equals one kind of um, study if uh, in that case, but it is taking account of that full daily distribution. Um, one thing that Luke did bring up in his talk, which um, I'd like to work on in the future is is looking specifically at that temperature humidity index, which takes account of that those humidity 
conditions as well as temperature. So this is just used temperature, the study. Yeah. Super. Thanks, Kenny. And, um, and Bill, there's, um, so your sort of um, resilient rural communities, um, you, you pointed out um, that the sort of getting a handle on sort of environmental resilience at the local level is a bit challenging. So um, again, there was a question about sort of what, what sort of data might be required to establish that sort of environmental baseline. And I was thinking again, that the our land report and some of the other work that's going on at NFE around sort of, you know, whether that can be sort of scaled down or whether that's still providing a sort of a slightly, yeah, whether it's just providing us with a national picture. Yeah, well, I guess, first of all, I should say that that um, it's not exactly my area of expertise. So this is where having a multidisciplinary team really helps. So I'd, I'd want the expertise of, of um, ecologists and, and environmental scientists in that. But um, what I can tell you is that when we held workshops, people could tell us about their local environmental resilience. Mm -hmm. So we've got a river that 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 goes through here. Uh, and it's really good for this or that, and it's cleaner or it's dirtier or, or whatever. Or uh, we've got a bit of native bush or we've got a, um, or we've got a national forest or whatever nearby. And that's really good for um, either tourism or it's good for the locals, it's good for our mental well-being. So when you talk with people, they know what their local resources are. I think that would be a way, a guide for how we might do that kind of large scale national data set. Um, I was reflecting on this preparing for this talk and I was wondering if some of the, the GIS um, data sets might actually allow us to uh, downscale them essentially or um, overlay the census um, map on the, on the ecological map and come up with something. Mm -hmm. Not sure what that would be, but um, but some guidance comes out of the workshops that we've done. Hmm. I guess kind of related to that um, is, you know, so you, you've done the sort of, um, the sort of aggregate sort of resilience at the sort of census plot. Well, yeah, basically using the census um, geospatial representations. Um, there was a question about whether or not um, there's resources for communi communities at the catchment scale. So a lot of the sort of land management and water management is happening at a sort of catchment level. Um, so I guess there's there's one question would be, are, are there kind of resources for communities to, when you talked about the workshops and the sort of self perceptions around their own resilience. So I guess, are there resources for communities at the catchment scale to use? And then also, I guess my own question is, yeah, what's gonna be the fit like between taking your process where it's disaggregated from actual census data and you're now kind of moving into much more yeah <laughs> where the data won't actually line up with the census boundaries it'll actually be based on a catchment boundary yeah whether that's kind of something that you kind of considered i haven't tried it yet but there's no reason you couldn't take uh, and this, this is all spatial data or it's all data mm -hmm. that's somehow spatially tagged um the the census data so i was using an sa2 level but there is a level down, which is quite fine grained. And so if you took catchment boundaries and figured out which census units were in that, um, I shouldn't say census units, but if you, which, which um, um, mesh blocks uh, were in that, you could, you could create a data set for a catchment um, and you could do that across the whole country. Uh, it's just not something I've done. Um, but you know, somebody who knows the maps and knows how to use the GIS, you, you link those two data sets together. And it's a question of just using the same process that we've used for developing this resilience uh, index and applying it at the catchment level. Yeah, and I guess um, and another question for you, Bill, um, is you know, what you've described, you, you've kind of framed um, these rural communities again as sort of complex systems, you know, social, institutional, economic, environmental, et cetera. Um, so, so have you kind of looked at or considered how those different, you know, notional capitals interact with each other and does high social resilience offset the, um, to what extent does the high social resilience offset some uh, lower economic resilience or lower institutional resilience? And is there kind of a, yeah, do they kind of just even out? That's one of the questions. Yeah, that, that's, 
Yeah, that's a good question. One of the ones that we started with and one of the ones that we've looked at in, in, our, in our research. Uh, yes, is the answer. There is some compensation that goes on. So uh, if you have uh, say high social resilience, but your economic resilience isn't quite as high, that actually balances each other out a bit. So communities tend to use the resources they have to be resilient. Um, now, having said that, the one question we haven't resolved is whether there is a minimum threshold for each resilience, so for each dimension. So is there a level at which you can't compensate anymore? So is there a minimum level of economic resilience that is required and that if you go below that, no amount of social or cultural capital is going to, to compensate? We don't have an answer to that question. So yes, there is some, some compensation, but we don't know the full extent of it. Yeah, oh, that's, that's really interesting. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, Kenny, just back to you. Um, so you've kind of talked or we've touched on sort of the, you know, the, the need and the extent to which farmers and farm systems will change. Um, and, you know, there's been a question, of course, you know, there is a lot of, there was the recent white paper on regenerative agriculture, and there's certainly a lot of kind of media attention on it as well. Um, and so there was a question about what sort of a minimum data set would you need that might be available now, possibly in partnership with farmers to forecast sort of financial scenarios if uh, farmers were to adopt certain regenerative principles, that there's, you know, um, anecdotal information about, you know, regenerative agriculture, it buffers the soil, et cetera. Um, but yeah, how, what data would you need? And is it possible to actually sort of, you know, look at that as a quantify the, the adaptation benefits as it were? Uh, yeah, thanks for that question. It's a really good one. Um, so I think I'll, I'll just start by highlighting that um, measuring heterogeneity in these uh, effects is really difficult. Um, you do need uh, really good data and it, it is, um, it's possible to sort of mistake um, differences in these effects that are related to one variable with, versus another. So for example, um, say we were going to measure resilience, uh, sorry, measure um, the adoption of regenerative agriculture, that adoption might be correlated with other sorts of things which might affect the sensitivity of drought. Um, so we'd, we, you'd have to be quite careful about um, trying to measure other, other drivers of that sensitivity across farms. Um, if, it, if it was really having a huge effect, I think you'd expect to see it with um, for 50 farms, I think for a few years at least, 50 farms would, would be enough. Yeah. If it's having a pretty moderate effect, uh, it would, you'd need quite a lot more to, to detect um, the size of it, I think. Um, that's my guess. But, but it's, you know, without seeing the data, it's, it's impossible to, to guess at those sorts of minimum, um, minimum size data sets for these sorts of analyses. Yeah, thanks for that. And um, Bill, just another question for you. You talked about the, um, yeah, the, the, the community's resilience as assessed using census data versus their own kind of, you know, self-assessed perception of how resilient they were or not. Um, and that those didn't always, well, that they didn't match up. Um, so did you want to comment, first of all, like did communities overestimate as it were their resilience or underestimate it? Um, and second, um, yeah, wh why do you think, <laughs> why do you think that was? <laughs> I guess, uh, first, I would hesitate to use over and underestimate because if we're talking about resilience, we're talking about the future and we don't know what that is. So actually, I've got no idea if the official statistics are right. Uh, we, we actually used three sources. We used official community and we used expert judgment and they didn't line up the three of them. And I've got no idea who's right and I won't know for another 10 or 20 years. So um, it, basically the relationship was really complicated and we couldn't figure it out in a simple way um, because we found that communities kind of understood individual, um, where they fell on the census data on, on, in individual ways. Like th they knew something about, let's say, um, where their income, how high or low their income was, or how many people were in social housing. So they knew something about those. But when you brought it all together, the kind of the summary picture of resilience, um, communities tended to see them, tended to rate themselves as more resilient, mm -hmm. but not always. Sometimes they had quite negative views when they didn't need to. Yeah, yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah. Um, so we are, 
uh, pretty much out of time. There's a couple of questions we haven't got to, but what I'll do is I'll direct those by email to um, Kenny and uh, Bill, and we'll ensure that those get addressed um, in the follow-up email. Um, so thank you all again for joining us, and thank you especially to uh, Kenny and Bill um, for taking the time out to, to present your work. Um, just so you know, there will be a short follow-up survey to get your feedback on the presentations and on the format. Um, and just a reminder that the final webinar next week, um, Tuesday, the 25th of May at 11 a.m., um, Anne Gale and Sean Awatiri, uh, looking at land use change as an adaptation to climate change. Um, and then also, of course, Monday, the 31st of May, we'll be hosting a one-day symposium at Tapapa in Wellington. Um, and more information on that will also be available online and in the follow-up emails. So thank you again, um, and kia ora koutou. Kia kite. Thanks, everyone.